Hi, this is Gabrielle Entile with Drug Topics. Today I'm going to be talking to Arman Balboni, MD, PhD, Chief Executive Officer of Apili Therapeutics, about favipiravir, a potential COVID-19 treatment for elderly and long-term care populations. Before we get started, here's the latest news from drugtopics.com. A recent analysis showed a surge in prescription pills for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, likely due to off-label prescribing. The JAMA study analyzed prescription patterns and found that hydroxychloroquine slash chloroquine fills increased by 1,977% since last year. States are slowly easing their barriers to pharmacist-provided COVID-19 testing. In early April, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services authorized licensed pharmacists to order and administer COVID-19 tests approved by the FDA. By mid-May, about two-thirds of states had adjusted regulations for pharmacist-provided testing, but just a handful of pharmacies had managed to navigate the maze of federal, state, and supply chain practicalities. And that's the latest news from drugtopics.com. Dr. Balboni, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm too uh, glad to be here. You're CEO of Apili Therapeutics. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the company does um, and your day-to-day -day at the company during the pandemic as well? The company was founded in, in 2015 um, as a singly focused company. Um, and the idea was to tackle um, infectious diseases uh, in, a, in a way that others don't or can't. And, and really what we do is we, we look for unmet need first. Uh, so is there a disease out there in the infectious disease world where folks are not um, able to uh, readily find a solution? And we really try and match programs then with, with the disease. Um, and, and we do that in a way that's um, agnostic to where something was created. And I think that's what's a little bit different here. We're not, we, well, we're all scientists, um, either by training or experience or both. Um, we're, we, we don't necessarily make the things in-house, um, but instead we go and find solutions to problems, which means that we have antifungals, antibiotics, uh, two antibiotics, and uh, now an antiviral program. Um, and so uh, for, for me, um, the daily mission uh, is, uh, is one of trying to keep the team moving forward with, uh, with the portfolio of products that really touch on a number of really important diseases. And, and so... I like to say that we're a socially conscious biotech. Um, we both do good and we do well. And I know people roll their eyes when they hear that, that you, know, you can be a socially conscious biotech company. Um, but, but we really are. We really try and find those tough uh, problems. And, and, and then we really relish the, the, um, the challenge to go find solutions. So what do you see as the significance of Apili's approach and focus on elderly and long-term care settings? So that's specifically looking at the antiviral program uh, that, that we have been working with Fujifilm Toyama on. It's a drug called Favipiravir. It's a broad spectrum antiviral. Um, uh, the long-term care setting, uh, as many of us have seen and know, even though it, you know, the, the, the pandemic uh, has not been going on for really that long, but it has disproportionately uh, affected those in the long-term care setting, the elderly. Doesn't mean that others can't get it, but we, we see a particular uh, real serious problem there. And, and in fact, in, in many places, including in Ontario, where our first clinical trial is being run for favipiravir in the long-term care setting, 80% of the morbidity and mortality um, has been associated with, uh, with the elderly. And so that, that is really um, a, a, an unmet need, um, and, and it really fits into our wheelhouse. And I think the other reason we're focusing on that group is just the, the, the uh, properties of the, of the drug. Favipiravir um, is uh, particularly well suited for that population uh, based on, on, on its properties, which are, it's oral, it's a tablet, unlike remdesivir, which is uh, injected, um, an IV. Um, and also uh, in the elderly, uh, even when a vaccine becomes available, and we all certainly hope one will, and I'm confident there will be one, um, the elderly are, are not necessarily uh, they don't necessarily respond to vaccines in the same way that everyone else does. Their immune system tends to be a bit more challenged. And so we think that uh, there will be a place for, uh, for this drug. Um, and then finally, uh, we focused on this group because nobody else was. And, and we are the only uh, randomized control trial um, looking uh, at this population for prophylaxis, meaning we're giving it soon after infection as soon as possible, very early on in the course of, of disease. Um, and uh, uh, you know, the, the only trial in the world to look at this really important population. So for all those reasons, we thought that it was a good fit for us. 
And before we go into the phase uh, two trials, can you talk a little bit about your professional background and your interest in infectious disease research? Sure. So um, I, I've been doing this for, for a while now. Um, my, my, my academic background, I did uh, my, my uh, graduate work in the MD PhD program at uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I guess now it's called the ICOM School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, and then I've spent uh, over 17 years in the U.S. military um, as an officer and in, 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 in infectious diseases, which means that I've spent my time at both infectious disease labs like USAMRID, um, I was at FDA for a while during the Ebola outbreak in 2014, helping to um, forward new drugs. Um, and then I was the director of clinical and regulatory affairs uh, for, for DOD, where we ran about 110 clinical trials around the world. And that's really where I started to develop this passion about unmet need. Because as you, as you probably know, most of the diseases that you're going after for DOD are, are, uh, are rather esoteric. So things like Ebola and HIV and malaria and loss of fever and dengue. I mean, things that, you know, neglected diseases that folks don't, don't really think about too much. But in, in the military, of course, you send troops everywhere. And so those diseases largely fall on the government to try and fix. Um, and, then, and then the rest of our team, um, really what keeps me interested is that we have a, a, a great team of infectious disease specialists from our chief medical officer to the scientists who are our program managers. Um, it, it really is a great environment to uh, to work in, and so I think it blends some of the professional passions that I've had with uh, um, kind of the the personal everyday working environment, where everybody is focused on the same uh, same types of diseases. So, in the age of COVID nineteen, there have been several sort of buzzword drugs, hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir being the most prominent, of course. Um, can you you talked a little bit about favipiravir, um, what it is and what it does? Why hasn't it yet gained the same amount of traction that these other potential treatments have? Well, I'll, I'll certainly give you my opinion about that. I mean, I think if you, if you do look at, at uh, broad spectrum antivirals, there really are only two right now um, that are at this stage of development, and that's the remdesivir Gilead drug that you talked about and favipiravir, uh, which is the Fujifilm Toyama chemical is the innovator, but there are other folks working on it. Um, I think uh, uh, Hyson Pharmaceuticals, Glenmark out of India, and then Chemrar out of Russia. And um, I think it's, it's, you know, a bit slower uh, because it was a, a little bit further behind. The mechanism of action, however, is the same as remdesivir. Um, I worked on both remdesivir and favipiravir when I was at FDA, um, looking at them for Ebola. Um, and so, so there's a lot of data around, around them. Um, I think early on, it didn't capture the attention because frankly remdesivir did. And, and I think that that's, that's okay. Um, favipiravir, uh, you know, after the splash of, of Gilead's drug, people then uh, in, the, in the field wait for the gold standard, which is the randomized controlled trial. And so whether mm -hmm. there have been tantalizing hints that favipiravir is working, most notably two uh, clinical trials run by uh, Hyson Pharmaceuticals in China, um, and now the Russian study, which has been reporting uh, positive data as well. Um, you know, these are, are again, preliminary studies and, and not the randomized controlled trials. And so I think, again, after the splash is made with remdesivir, everyone waits for the RCTs. And, and so that's what we're waiting for. And I think um, there is now beginning to be some attention paid to favipiravir, uh, particularly because it is differentiated from remdesivir. And importantly, um, drugs like hydroxychloroquine that you talked about really gained a lot of attention because of publication by press. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, a really, it's, a, it's a bit of a sore spot with me and many others that um, it, it can derail trials like you see with hydroxychloroquine and the, and the retracted studies out of The Lancet. Um, it really does have the, um, the um, potential to, to uh, derail large-scale randomized controlled trials and, and we w then won't know if it works. And so I like to say that favipiravir is probably one RCT away from just really becoming part of the everyday um, um, discussion around, around these drugs. So what can you tell us about the phase two study with favipiravir? So favipiravir is, a, is an already approved drug um, in Japan for influenza. There have been uh, two phase threes run in the U.S., um, and uh, a number of uh, phase threes in other locations. Now there are a couple of uh, phase threes running in Europe um, and one in Russia. Um, but the Fujifilm studies 
uh, really set the, set the tone here, and which it means that it's been extensively studied. It's been in over 3,000 people. And so safety, the safety profile is really well understood with this, with this drug. Um, and uh, um, it's, it is again approved for pandemic flu in Japan and China. It's been recently approved for COVID-19 in Russia. Um, and I expect that India uh, will also end up with a COVID-19 approval, um, at least for emergency use, sort of the equivalent, in the next couple of days. And so I think, again, this, this is uh, really moving forward. I think the other thing we know about this drug is the mechanism of action. We know how it works. It targets the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is a protein um, important for maturation, packaging, and, um, uh, uh, and then subsequent reinfection of other cells. Um, so it's really important to get it on board early. Remdesivir, by the way, works the same way. And so I think scientifically, we know how it works. And, and again, we have a, a very, very good understanding of the side effects profile. If I, if I had to say there's one knock on this drug, and there is, it's the fact that in the preclinical studies, it was noted that there may be some teratogenicity or, or, or fetal embryonic kind of effects in animals. And so we haven't seen that in people, but um, we, have, we have noted that in animals. And I, and I suspect that that's a concern for folks going forward. It's, it is, by the way, another reason that we thought that the um, the long-term care setting was probably the, the most appropriate for this drug, the profile of the drug. Um, if there are concerns about potential teratogenicity, um, the, the best way to deal with that is to, to simply not give it to people um, uh, who may be uh, at risk of, of uh, getting pregnant or having children. And so I think, again, this population is, is, uh, is, is fairly low risk in terms of that. Um, and then I think, uh, again, um, uh, Favipiravir scientifically is, is very well understood. Lots of people have seen it. Um, and it's, it is moving forward in randomized control trials, which is, which is incredibly important. Um, and so I think for, for all of those reasons, it's, it's, a, it's a very solid uh, program at this point. Not, not speculative and certainly not a science project. Dr. Baboni, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me.